for modern man welcomes you to the services of Calvary Temple Worship Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where Dr. Paul E. Kano is pastor. The sermon you are about to hear was prepared live as part of the regular services at the worship center. If you have questions or desire a catalog of other tapes available, you may write Manna for Modern Man, P.O. Box 11247, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46856. We encourage you to use your Bible and take notes as you listen carefully to the Word of God as it is presented. I've not been in a Sunday evening service for quite some time. My brother came off the side of the platform and said, Phil, the crowd's down quite a bit from its normal attendance. <laughs> I feel a little disoriented. When you start getting ready at 3.30 in the morning, <laughs> you're over-prepared for a service. Being disoriented reminds me of a little story I heard about the man who had a terrible head injury and was given up for dead. And uh, he woke up inside a coffin and he resumed consciousness. And he had that disoriented feeling, sort of like I do tonight. And he said, if I'm alive, then what am I doing in this coffin? And if I'm dead, then why do I have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Could we bow now for a word of prayer? There's a story that I've been waiting four months on the 4th of February for the date to be able to share with all of you. Because I'm talking about being a little disoriented. This is a true story, as opposed to some of the other lies that I've told behind this pulpit. <laughs> the story has to do with Steve Weaver, and you have to wait four months to be able, from an accident such as mine, to be able to reproduce a story like this. But on the evening of the accident, most of us will recall, I was on my way up to the women's retreat. My mother was there on the campground. And uh, Steve Weaver went to my mother and said, Sister Pano, there's, there's been an accident and I, I need to take you. Phil's been involved. Now you can imagine, they didn't know at that point whether I was dead or alive or, or what the extent was to my in injuries. And they got to the hospital there in Angola and received no further information. And so they began driving to Fort Wayne. They couldn't come down I-69 because of all of the traffic as a result of the accident. And so they began going the back roads. And as they traveled the back roads, Steve, with his uncanny ability, got lost. <laughs> he was seeking to console my mother. And he said, Sister Pano, I, I just feel that, that we ought to read from the scripture together. And if you would just take my Bible, I, I want you to open up to what I know is Phil's favorite portion of scripture. And I think if you just would, would read it aloud, it would bring comfort to us at this time. Now, my favorite scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, And I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And 
You shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart and I will be found of you. Now that's my favorite verse. That's an awfully good favorite verse. Steve Weaver, though, told my mother to open to Jeremiah 22, verse 19, and asked my mother to read it aloud. And it says, He will be buried with a donkey's burial. dragged off and thrown out beyond the gates of the city. I've waited a long time to get to share that with you all. Paul was mentioning a little earlier about Super Bowl Sunday last week. There are some advantages to being paraplegic. You get to stay home on Super Bowl Sunday night. <laughs> but in 1969, there was the Walter Payton of his day named Gail Sayre. She was at the Football Writers Guild where they were going to be giving the George S. Hallis Award. And there in front of all of his contemporaries, Gail Sayers, the great running back for the Chicago Bears, said of a man named Brian Piccolo who was laying in a hospital bed and was fighting not a Super Bowl championship, but the battle for his life, the battle with cancer. And there in front of all of his colleagues, the toughest men in the world, Gail Sayers said of Brian Piccolo, I love Brian Piccolo, and I want you to love him too. The reason why I say that is because there are some men tonight that I would like to introduce, and without any hesitation, I say I love these men, because these are the men that the Lord used to minister to me when no one other than my family members were allowed to be present. I know and certainly give all the glory to the Lord. But I'm also grateful that he's chosen to use earthly instruments. And I was blessed right from the very beginning with the presence of not only the Holy Spirit and a godly family, but a group of physicians that had made a commitment to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The very first man that I looked up and saw was a man named Dr. Mike Schatzlein. He was the surgeon who had operated on my father for his open heart surgery. And when Dr. Schatzlein walked into the room, he brought a great peace. Dr. Schatzlein and Mary are here. I'd like for the two of them to stand. I'd like for you to, to make them feel welcome tonight, if you would, please. Dr. Schatzlein, would you and Mary stand? Our family has been blessed because our family physician has been not only our physician, but our friend and a spiritual counselor to us. And Dr. Richard Jurgen is a man that I love as well. There wasn't a day that he missed other than the few days that he had to be gone out of town, but what either early in the morning or late in the night, my family physician would come at the right moment and take me by the hand and say a prayer for me. And during some of the times that were rather treacherous for me to go through, it was a great comfort to look up and to see your Christian family physician holding you by the hand and holding you before the throne of grace. I'd like for Dr. Richard Jurgens to stand and for you to make our family doctor feel welcome, please. Dr. Jurgens.
I'd hope that there would be another gentleman here tonight. His name is Dr. Rudy Cashman. He was my neurosurgeon, but because of a seminar that's taking place tonight, he called yesterday and expressed his apologies for not being able to be here. It's hard to describe Rudy Cashman in one service. So perhaps it's best I not try. But in his absence, I certainly want it to be known that Rudy Cashman was a man that the Lord used to give me the encouragement because he never came and told me what I would not be able to do. He only came to the room and told me what I could do. And I thank the Lord for him. Now, I've introduced to you the men that have brought me from where I was to where I am. I'd like to introduce you to some men that are in charge of taking me from where I am to where I'm going. I had a decision that had to be made, and you as a church prayed for me. And I feel the Lord gave us direction as we made our decision concerning who was to represent me in what is some very, very complicated and very detailed proceedings in court. And I'd like for you to meet my attorney. I'll tell you the kind of man he is. He's very quickly become a friend. Because last Sunday night, he salvaged me from having to watch the Super Bowl with three kids and two women. <laughs> he came to my home and sat there with me. And I'd like for you to meet my attorney, Mr. Jim Grossman. Jim, would you stand and let us welcome you, please? And the last man that I want to introduce to you with his wife is someone that um, I will tend to get emotional about. Because, you see, I was in a wheelchair just a matter of two weeks ago, and I was told that was probably going to be my mainstay for being transported around. I didn't like looking at life from my brother's perspective. <laughs> The Lord brought into my life a man by the name of Jay Fry, who is my physical therapist. He gave me an option and said that I could either come to his office that is very, very hectic, and his appointment schedule will allow me to be with him around once a week, or if I would allow him to, he would come to my home and give me whatever time he could, because he believed the wheelchair was not going to be my destiny, and he believed that Sunday night, February 2nd, I was going to walk onto a platform and greet the congregation of Calvary Temple. I owe him more than my words are capable of expressing. That's the good news. The bad news is he's been making me walk and walk and walk and stand and stand and stand. Then when he found out he was coming to church to hear me speak this evening, he said, you have a 20-minute maximum on standing tonight. I want you to, to meet him, and I want his wife to stand with him because she has sacrificed to let him be at my home at 10 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock at night. He's missed meals to come and to bend these rather tight-muscled legs. And every day he commands my feet to move and never lets me give up one short but makes me go one more. And I thank the Lord for Jay Fry and his wife, Cheryl. Would you all stand and let us express our gratitude to you? There's one word that would probably be able to sum up what's been my experience for the past four months. A little word, and it's spelled F E A R. Fear. I've had a lot of fear. I'm the song leader that, that led you in singing, There is no fear in the perfect love of God. And why should I fear when the Lord is on my side? And those words, <laughs> that's how afraid I was of needles. 
And Dr. Kolb, I always said that if I ever had to have a shot, the one place I never wanted to have a shot was in my tummy. And yet in the hospital, four times a day, every day, those cruel nurses would make their way in with those eight-foot needles. <laughs> I was afraid of cars. Now I'm afraid of semis. <laughs> the fear of being in a close place is one that had to be dealt with rather quickly because for two hours, Alone in a car, I had the front seat and back seat and trunk wrapped around me. I was unaware of where my legs were and couldn't feel them. And the fear of, are they broken or is this pain in my back that's preventing me from being able to breathe, telling me that those legs are perhaps paralyzed. Dr. Mike Stockline said to me one day in the hospital, have you had your blue day yet? And to that point, I hadn't. And I did really well until the night before I, I went home from the hospital, and then there was a fear that I had not been prepared for at all. And it was the fear, believe it or not, of going home. And I couldn't shake it. And it became my blue day. I was afraid of, of getting into the car and riding with Dad and approaching the first stoplight and aware there, was car, there were cars that were approaching us from behind. I remember the first time I saw my house and the horrible fear. What happens if the boys want to wrestle tonight? Will they reject their dad now that I cannot get on the floor to wrestle with them? What about Maggie? when I can't hold her, and I'll never forget the night when I thought that I was alone and the doorbell rung and there was no one to answer it, and I was concerned that the babysitter had gone to the door, Terry had gone to the grocery and had let someone in, and I began calling out, and there was no response, and I had not yet had the expertise of someone such as Jay Fry to teach me how to move. And so I tried to get my way to the wheelchair and fell out of the bed and was on the floor and crawled down the hallway to try to get to my children's bedroom, fearful that someone had, had broken into the house. And what do we do now? Then there was the fear of, of being here tonight, the fear of, am I going to be able to stand up? Will I trip over a cord? Will I fall on the step? Will I be able to make it through an entire service without there being other complications that have been very, very traumatic for me? So you see, four months of my life have been dealt with, have been concerned with dealing with fear. And yet, uh, I know that I'm not alone. Because I think if we all will drop the veneers of our life, we all are capable of confessing that maybe there's a little fear of something in your life. Because every one of us live with vast reservoirs of fulfillment and areas of complete potential. But we can never get to those reservoirs because the road that leads to them is guarded by a dragon named fear. And so I want to direct your attention to what the Lord gave to me, found in the scripture that became my source of strength. It's found in the 27th Psalm. And I'd like for you to turn to it with me if you would. Psalm 27, I'd like for you to just follow along as I read just the first three verses, because this is exactly what the Lord directed me to when I was having to deal one by one 
with some of my fears. Let's just take a look. It's gotten real quiet here since I talked about all that stuff. How many are courageous enough to lift a hand and say, I've got something in my life that every so often it rears its head and I find out when it says booga booga, I'm afraid a little bit. Can you, let's see, just lift. Well, how come y'all just keep looking at me like, well, you big ninny, anybody could go through an accident like that. Psalm 27, follow along. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Now, if we were to take this and seek to do an exposition on it, it would be very, very simple because the psalm very easily falls into the two categories. Verses 1 through 6 deal with one little word called faith. And verses 7 through 14 deal with the word fear. Now, why am I drawing your attention to that? Because, you see, faith and fear are not very far apart. Because fear that will soar is faith. But faith that sinks is fear. And then if we look real carefully, and, and it's probably not possible for all of you to do unless you have a Greek translation of the Old Testament, you'd find that right underneath where it says Psalm 27, in the Greek, the Septuagint, it says, a psalm of David before he was anointed. Now that's important. Because, you see, before David knew what it was to have that anointing presence of the Lord, David had to deal with fear. We, we've heard our pastor say it. They were words that I held on to. And that is that you can never know the, the, the blessedness of the presence of God in your life. That anointing oil over your being. Unless you've paid a price for it first. And this is the psalm of David before he was anointed. There's one other thing that I'd just like to have you jot down. I like to make up quotes. And this is one that I made up after meeting Jay Fry. And that's this. You see, it's not failure, but it's low aim. That's the crime. Did you hear that? not failure, but it's low aim that's the crime. Now, why am I saying that? Because until tonight, see, the Lord has a way of really working things out. I had a fear. Can I tell you what it was? It was a fear of falling. Because I haven't fallen yet. Not one time have I fallen. I walked all the way down to Paul Craig's house and back in the middle of a windstorm with rain coming into my face the last quarter of a mile. Never fell. Put my overcoat on tonight. Went to kiss Andrew goodbye and fell flat on the back. And you know what? It didn't hurt that bad. Because you see, it's not failure that's the crime. It's low aim. And I looked at that wheelchair for a second and said, maybe I better get back in that. And then, no. It's fear that makes you aim too low. And if you watch out, that fear will grab you by the neck and strangle all the good life out of you. So I want us to take a look, because I like the way David begins, the Lord is my light. What's one of the first fears you can recall? For me, it was darkness. How many can remember being afraid of the dark? <laughs> How many never... I shouldn't do this. This is going to make me look stupid. How many never let your hand or your leg like hang out over the edge of the bed and you're little? <laughs> We've learned in our house to still not do that because Maggie is just developing teeth. <laughs> but I want you to look at one word, and here's my first point. I've only got three. And I'm going to go sit down. 
and die. <laughs> Will you look at where it says in verse 1, whom shall I fear? But then down towards the end it says, whom shall I dread? Now that's important because there's two different words. The first word, whom shall I fear, is a rather ordinary word for fear. But the second word is pakad. And the word pakad means to be in awe or to be intimidated by. And if you're making any notes on what I've learned from my experience with fears, it's number one, overcome intimidation. Overcome intimidation. That's why David says, whom shall I dread? That first word, just that normal word of fear, but that second one is the one that makes you be intimidated by someone else. When Paul was, was talking about the church and its progress, I reflected back to the old building and I can remember, you know, my dad, how many look at dad and say, now there's one loving pastor. One, two, three. <laughs> Dad can sometimes have sort of a cruel sense of humor. There was a man. I had stepped out into the hallway. Church was just ready to begin on a Thursday evening, and I stepped out into the hallway. And when I did, I, I looked to my right, and down the hallway was coming Son of Godzilla down the hallway. This was the biggest, I mean, he was the biggest human being I have ever seen in my life. Now, I can't lift my hands real high, but he... He was real big, and he was real mean-looking, and he, he just kind of filled the hallway, and he talked in grunts, and he said, Is this Pano's church? I said, I'm not sure. I'm just visiting. Just <laughs> walked in. He said, I want to talk to Pano. And I said, well, I'm going to find one for you real quick. But I, I'm, his, I'm his son, Phil. I said, uh, the service is about to begin. <laughs> and the pastor's on the platform. <laughs> he said, i got to talk to him. So I uh, walked, and I, I remember putting my hand on his back. His neck was on up. <laughs> and I did, just there was no fat. You know, it was just all Gibraltar. <laughs> and... We made our way towards the back there of the church off the side of the platform. And as we, we got back there, I said, wait here and I'll go get Dad. He's my dad and I know he'll come right out here and talk to you. <laughs> and I went out and there's my dad. And I said, Dad, there's proof out here that evolution has taken place. <laughs> you must come quickly. He said, tell him I'll talk to him after the service. I said, you come tell him you'll talk to him after the service. I said, Dad, please, this man looks very serious, and if I go out there, he could hurt me. And Dad, Dad gave me one of those real disgusted looks, but I've, I've grown up with those looks, and it did not intimidate me, and we walked off the platform, and here was this man that I was fearful was going to take my life. I looked at him and I said, Al, this is my father, Pastor Pano. And the moment I said that, do you remember this? Good. <laughs> he, he, this big old guy fell right on his knees. Son crying. He said, I heard you preach on Sunday night while I was riding in my car with a shotgun going to go kill somebody. And I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Dad knelt down and led him to the Lord. I felt dumber in a box of rocks. <laughs> See, there's those great big dragons. And we have to learn to, to overcome intimidation. I want you to look real quickly at verse 10. It says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. 
kind of interesting. I did a word study on the words forsaken me. They're the very same words that are found in the Messianic Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you see, when we're overcoming intimidation, we have to overcome the fear sometimes of, of being alone. I remember when my mother and father and brother and then my wife each said their goodbyes. And they began to roll me into the operating room. And there were people I did not know. And they began doing things to me that were totally alien to me. And there was the fear of being alone. Maybe there's a fear of rejection. He says, my father and my mother, they have forsaken me. The fear of being alone is coupled with that fear of being rejected. I'm going to let you pry into my life for a little bit just to tell you that one of the awful fears was that fear of coming home and realizing that now when I would go to bed with my wife, there would be braces on my legs to keep my feet from dropping. And in order to turn, I would have to have her every two hours take pillows and rotate me so that I wouldn't develop bed sores. And that awful fear that maybe I'll be rejected. You see, we have to learn to overcome intimidation because not only has she slept with me, she has carried me and she has washed my feet and she's dried them and she's placed my socks upon those feet and helped me as I have forced my feet into my shoes and that which I was intimidated by was something that was easily overcome number one is overcome intimidation but look at verses three and four And at the end it says, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that shall I seek. We underline where it says, one thing I shall ask for the Lord. Because you see, in the hospital, if I had begun with trying to deal with the individual fears, they'd have gone on ad infinitum, ad nauseum. I can remember, I'm looking down at Dr. Juergens, I can remember the first time he came in and they had told me now I'd broken my back and I had no motor skills from my knees down. And I remember looking at Dr. Juergens and saying, well, doctor, can't get any worse. And that became a little joke between the two of us because just three days later I contracted the flu. And after I got over the flu, I said to Dr. Juergens, well, doc, thank God that's over. The worst now is behind us. Then I got strep throat. Then after I got over strep throat, I remember looking up there, looking like I had barely survived a concentration camp, and saying to Dr. Jurgens, well, Doc, thank goodness that's over. Nothing worse can happen. And then I received an internal infection that shot my fever up, to over 103 and I remember when he came back I determined I was never ever going to say again the worst has now happened <laughs> and you see David said one thing I've asked he'd learned that you don't just try to deal with those one things and say if I get this over then I'm all right but he had learned to hone in on saying there's one thing that I've asked I'm asking the Lord to help me to give the ability to relate this to you. And look what he says is his one desire, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, you see, David's hidden off in a cave. What does he mean when he says he'd like to be able to dwell in the house of the Lord? Well, there in Shiloh was a tent that we know to be the tabernacle. And in that holy of holies, there was an ark of the covenant. And over that Ark of the Covenant, there was the Shekinah, the glory of God. And as long as that Shekinah was present, they were always going to win. 
Now let me tell you what I've got down here. You see, when we're in a foreign environment, that's when we become uncomfortable. David was in a foreign environment. Some of us are in foreign environments when we're surrounded by that dragon of fear. And we think if we can just get back into a familiar atmosphere, we can get confident again. And that's the second thing I want you to write down. Maintain confidence. David said, I, there's one thing I wish of God. I just wish I could get down there where that Shekinah is. Because if I could get to where that Shekinah dwells, I'd be protected from all the enemies, and that would give me confidence. But can't you hear the words coming from the New Testament back to David? What? Know ye not? You are the temple of God. And we don't have to get to a church. I couldn't get to a building. But one thing I could ask for from the Lord, and that you can seek for too, and that is that you can dwell in his house forever. For he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And when the enemies are camped around about you, you can maintain confidence because you're not in an alien environment. You're in the presence of the Lord. So wherever you're standing is holy ground. But you see, one of the problems that we have is being able to acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Will you skip down real quickly with me and look at what it says in verse 8. When thou didst say, Seek my face, my heart said to thee, Thy face, O Lord, I shall seek. And I wish you'd underline that. David said, How can I maintain confidence? How can I have this conscious awareness of your presence in my life, Lord? And then he gives us the key to that in verse 8. The key to having the knowledge of the presence of God is when we can join with David who said, Lord, when you told me to do something, that I did. Because you see, when you've got obedience in your life, it keeps the channels open for the presence of the Lord to be able to be manifest. That was one of the very first things the Lord wanted to do with me. Because you see, David also wrote and said, Thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me, because before I was afflicted, I went astray. And immediately, the Lord in my life, it didn't take three or four months of trying to decide. It happened before they slid the board under my back and pulled my body from the car. In that automobile, I said, Lord, remove every area as I ask for forgiveness for every disobedience. And when you say, seek my face, Help me to see your face immediately. You see, when Jay comes to the house, he looks at the feet and tells me every day, send the message to those toes to move. And I do, and, and they don't move. And sometimes you get frustrated, but you see, there's a blockage in my back. It stops the nerves. There's the message going from my head to my feet, but because of that place of interference, there isn't the movement. And the Lord wants us to know the same thing, is that when there's an interference from us, it's not because he isn't speaking, but it's because something is shutting the current off. David said, I'll maintain confidence and I'll be aware of the presence of God because, Lord, I've been obedient and now I'm confident. And then thirdly, look with me if you will at verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. We underline where it says a level path. And let me tell you what the Lord taught me. Not only to overcome intimidation, and to seek to maintain confidence, but if you have a fear, then listen to this. Stay balanced. Stay balanced. David said, Lord, teach me thy way and lead me in a level path. Don't let me 
over exaggerate my circumstances. Dad mentioned that there's a couple little girls here from camp, and I don't know where they're located, but this is giving away a little bit of our director's formula up at the camp. We start off on Monday night and tell all the kids that are there for you. Stay with their counselor. <laughs> now that's on Monday afternoon. And by Monday night, I can call them to the platform. And I'll say to one of the campers, have you seen the swamp man? Yes, sir, I have. <laughs> Describe him to me. He's nine feet tall. He's got green stuff all over him. You've seen him? Oh, yes. Where did you see him? Down near the swamp. We don't have any swamps at the camp any longer. <laughs> By Thursday night, now keep in mind the swamp man hasn't even appeared. We haven't dressed the staff member up yet. He has dead rats hanging from his mouth. <laughs> they saw him eating dormitories. It goes on and on. Why? Because they've not learned to stay balanced. They've not been on a level place, and they've learned that fear always causes us to over-exaggerate. My biggest fear in the hospital was when they were going to take my stitches out. Now, I'd faced some pretty tough things, and I'm one tough guy. <laughs> that man came in, and I said to him, go ahead and make my day. <laughs> That's not the truth. I just kept putting it off. I wouldn't even remind Dr. Hoffman that the stitches were there. And then when I found out that it was a long wire that went down the length of my back, there's no way I wanted him pulling that wire out. I even told him when he came in, I said, you know, I've learned to live with that wire, and I kind of like it in there. <laughs> and he said, roll over. I said, go home and talk to your dog, but you're not going to talk to me that way. I'm not going to roll over. And I rolled over, and I remember just waiting and waiting, and I was flinched, <laughs> my teeth. I said, just tell me now, and you're going to take it out. And he said, it's out. <laughs> and I felt so silly. I had had sleepless nights about those stitches. But you see, fear will always cause you to over-exaggerate if you don't stay balanced. <laughs> Jacob, dad's been preaching about the God of a second chance, and that was his first character on television, was Jacob. And Jacob said, all these things are against me, and Jacob didn't realize that all those things that had happened had happened for his benefit. That's why it says in Romans 8, 28, for God is at work in all things. See, I'm not talking about the balance on these crutches, but, but I've learned Stay balanced. And we all need to learn to stay balanced. My wife was talking. Abel Robles had called. I heard them in the other room, and apparently Abel had said, I'm so sorry to have heard of Philip's accident. And for those of you who don't know my wife very well, the feathers went up, and she said, my husband didn't have any accidents. God had everything under control. He stay balanced. For God is at work in all things, putting them together for good. I get reserved parking places everywhere I go. <laughs> and you want to know something? If I'm standing in a crowded restaurant, it looks like there's going to be a long time before we get a table. These crutches make people get so compassionate. They move you up real quickly, and you just get to walk ahead of all the other people. There's a lot of things in my favor you people don't know anything about. Stay balanced. Say, so how do you stay balanced? Don't be afraid to laugh. Look what David says, and I close with this. He says in verse 13, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord 
in the land of the living, wait for the Lord and be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Would you underline where it says, I would have despaired? Because you see, if you keep living with that fear that you raised your hand to represent a few moments ago, that fear will make you live life with the blindfold. David said, I was despairing unless. If you're living life fearing rejection, being alone, fearing pain, fearing a tragedy that you think has happened in your life, overcome intimidation. Learn what it is to maintain confidence by practicing the presence of the Lord and being obedient. And then staying balanced, because all these things aren't against you. God's at work putting it all together for your good. So do what David said in verse 14. Wait. Don't run. Don't run away from the fear. Face it head on. Admit the fear. Commit the fear in prayer.